Thank you, Kimberly. One of the goals of a liberal education, at least as I understand it, is being able to deal with change and complexity as you go through your life. And this is something that's very, very near and dear to technologists' heart. Um, what I want to start by doing is putting to bed the idea that as an engineer, anything that you study in school is what carries you through your whole career. So this is a list of technologies that I studied when I was in college. You've got a mixture of computer languages up there and editors and so on and so forth. Uh, this is a list of technologies I've used in the last four weeks. And what you'll notice is there's exactly one overlap. And any computer science student in the room is now laughing at me because this is a text editor and I'm considered something of a Luddite because I'm still using it. Okay? So even for engineers, even as everyone here is talking about, you know, they've got this liberal education and I'm feeling like, yeah, as opposed to what I did, which was the computer science major. Even for computer science majors, things are going to change. You're going to need to learn new things throughout your career. So let's take a step back and talk about what engineers actually do, okay? Makes engineers really cranky when stuff is broken. This is why we're so cranky so often, okay? And for the 99% of us who aren't psychopaths, so the way we express our empathy for the rest of the human race is trying to fix the broken stuff, all right? Now, I know it doesn't always look that way, Okay, I know sometimes you think we get our jollies like, hey, let's leave a new release of this software right, and see where it takes us. But no, no, really we're trying to help. We're trying to fix the broken stuff. Um, true story, I was on vacation. I was in Hawaii and I read an article in one of these magazines about how there was a woman who lost her rings while she was swimming because it slipped off her fingers because of the sunscreen. I spent the rest of my vacation trying to design some kind of apparatus that would keep the jewelry on your finger while still being inexpensive and environmental and all this. Okay, this is how I spent my vacation. Okay, this is what engineers do. So what I want to do is I want to take you through a few examples of places where there's been something complex or something broken that engineers felt like they wanted to fix and had to bring together different streams, whether it was technology coming together or business needs or what users wanted to do to develop technology that was actually useful. Okay, so let's start with the television. Okay, the television's been around since the 50s. When television came out, people thought it was pretty cool. Right? The broadcasters would broadcast these shows, you would be home when the shows were on, you'd turn on the TV and you'd watch them. And that's where things sat for about 20 years. And you know, television was pretty successful, people thought that was pretty cool. In about the mid-70s, much to delight of the prior speaker, we started to get technology that let you watch shows when you wanted to watch them. Okay, the video cassette recorder, the VCR, was invented in 1975. Um, followed on to that was a DVD. Stores like Blockbuster and you know, other video stores came around in kind of the 80s where you could get the video that you wanted and you could watch it when you wanted. In theory, you could even program your VCR to get the show that you wanted when you wanted it. In practice, the blinking 12 on the VCR was fodder for late night comedians for years because people could not figure out how to program the darn thing. Okay. Meanwhile, on the technology side, things were changing. Okay. Discs were getting faster. This was important because it meant that video could be recorded onto a disc in real time and then played back quickly enough so that you wouldn't see stuttering. Okay. Computer hardware was getting cheaper. It was starting to get built into more and more things that you could have around the house. And the idea of a computer talking to a different computer to exchange data was starting to become more and more viable. Okay, it used to be computers didn't talk to other computers, but you started to have a network, you started to have that possibility. Taking those things together, you can get something like a DVR, you can get a TiVo box, which phones home every night to get the program guide data and can record the video and you can play it back. And by the way, since it's a computer and it has a user interface, you don't deal with the blinking 12 anymore, right? You're actually using something with the menu system that you know, normal people can figure out how to navigate. So it's an example of change, you know, different, different streams of change and complexity all coming together and turning into something more simple. Okay, let's take a more recent example. Let's take YouTube, okay? We take it one step further, and now, okay, it's video again. You're putting video on a big server in the sky, right? It's so common that computers talk to each other, you don't even think about it. You just, you have your camera, and then it winds up on YouTube, and you get things like Gangnam Style. Now, then after you get things like Gangnam Style, you get all the people who want to do parodies of Gangnam Style, and they can all put their stuff on YouTube. You get the people with the babies. Um, you can get the Oregon Ducks. Okay, the Naval Academy, and I cannot explain this, got involved in this one, all right, and my personal favorite, the Klingons. Okay, you get all of this stuff on YouTube. Now, 
this actually gets kind of complicated. Now, in these cases, these are parodies, and the idea of a parody has been protected against copyright claims for a long time. It's, a, it, it's sort of, the, the law in that one is known. If you're making a parody, the copyright owner can't, well, they can get upset, but they can't do anything about it legally. Okay, but YouTube had some other problems. I don't know if you've seen any of these videos on here. Uh, maybe the baby dancing to Beyonce, that one was pretty popular, the wedding dance. But they share the same problem, which is that in all of these cases, the people who made the videos took content that they did not have the rights to and somehow incorporated them into the videos, okay? No matter how good the videos were, this made the content owners fairly unhappy. They were very, very worried about piracy. They were very worried about losing control of this content, and it was a problem between YouTube and, say, the music labels. The music labels wanted this content to come down off the site. Now, this could have been fought out in the courts, and in some cases, some of it was fought out in the courts, but at the same time, the engineers and the technologists looked at technology that might be able to help here. There was technology that had been around since even before YouTube was founded that could take an audio track or take piece of video and create a unique, it's called a fingerprint of the audio or the video, which you could then compare against other fingerprints to decide if the audio and the video were the same thing. Okay? Now this became a very powerful tool in the complex situation of the rights holders wanting to enforce their rights and people wanting to be able to do cover versions of Lady Gaga, which is what that girl with the keyboard is doing in the middle and, and put it up on YouTube. But with a system that took the fingerprints of the audio or the video and presented a list to the rights holders of, you know, here's some video that you own, what would you like to do with it? This suddenly made the record labels much more comfortable with what YouTube was doing because they did feel like they could control the video. Okay? So in this case, we're taking technology to solve a problem that you could maybe argue shouldn't be a problem, that you could maybe argue the record labels could have done this on their own anyway, but it was necessary to solve a business problem which was getting the labels more confident that YouTube actually did have the rights holder's interest in mind when they were still allowing people to, I don't know, create tribute videos to Clarence Clemens, which is what's going on in the middle over there, or putting a video of their daughter's dance recital up for grandma to see. Okay, I'm gonna give one more example of complexity and change and how engineers deal with it. Um, when one of my last jobs at Google was with Google.org, which is the philanthropic arm of Google that uses technology to address global challenges. In 2010, inspired by the earthquake in Haiti, a group of engineers came together to form the crisis response team. And what they wanted to do was take Google's technology and use it to help people affected by a crisis, whether it was the people directly affected, first responders, uh, just members of the general public who were interested. And they started by taking Google products and providing additional information about the crisis on the product. What you're looking at here is a Google map, and it's been overlaid with some government information about the path of Hurricane Isaac. Okay, this is a fairly common thing to do, and there are a lot of organizations that will provide this kind of data, whether it's the National Weather Service or the Red Cross or whatever, and they can put it on there. So this was very popular, and it was considered very useful, but at the same time, technology continues to change. And two other streams were going on at the same time. One was increasing use of smartphones. Okay, so a lot of people now have phones where they can get very rich information sent to their phones. And agencies like the U.S. Geological Survey, the National Weather Service, and so on, are, are publish feeds of alerts when something is happening or has happened that would be very useful if only they could get them out to the right people at the right time. So the most recent release from the crisis response team has been something called public alerts, which will send these alerts to your phone if it knows you're in the, an area that's been affected by a crisis. The interesting thing, well, there's a lot of interesting things about this project, but an interesting thing from a technology standpoint is that the team had to keep in mind the goal, which is get information to people affected by crisis, rather than the specific product or project they were building, which was put the good information on maps. This sort of thinking, where you're looking at the whole problem and you're figuring out how to solve the entire thing, that's what people need, is what separates out a technologist who's gonna be successful from someone who just stays in the first bubble that I showed on the first slide and says, this is the technology I know and this is all I'm gonna do with it. So when I think about the value of a liberal education, I think about the possibility of looking at a problem holistically, looking at certainly the technology that's being developed and what it can be used for, but also how people might interact with it and what they might want to do with it. That's what's necessary in order to make very good technology to make a very good product, and that's what's necessary to untangle the complexity that you know, sometimes we engineers bring on ourselves. 
I'd like to thank you for your attention and just point out one more thing, which is that I never did find a better solution for keeping my ring on than a piece of string tied around my wrist. <laughs> thank you for your time.